I love the fact that we have uh, you guys here and worshiping here, but I love the fact that we also have a bunch of people that are worshiping in the uh, third space right up front, Brian and Catherine, and I got to talk to them, and they are like five feet away from the screen. And I remember when I was a kid, my parents said, don't sit so close to the TV. Well, they're in front of an 18-foot TV. That's kind of incredible, isn't it? And uh, if you're watching live streaming, we're so glad to have you as a part of a worship service. We believe you're part of our church family as well. I want to continue our series on one another. And today I want to talk to you about how, how to have meaningful, awesome friendships. So I was talking with somebody about a month ago, and they looked at me and they said, hey, pastor, I don't have time for friends in my life. I'm just really too busy for friends right now. And I smiled and I said, well, if you're too busy for friends, you're too busy. Anybody agree with me on that? Well, that's not very good. How many of you agree with me that if you're too busy for friends, you're too busy? Amen? Because life is all about relationships, and, and I promise you, if you don't build this in the first and the middle part of your life, later in life, you're going to regret this. And one of the great tasks of life is building these meaningful relationships in life. And if you don't build them early and in the middle stages of life, I, I promise you, you will be lonely later on. And I don't want you to get there and be lonely later on. So I want you to be intentional, and I want to talk about being intentional about building great, meaningful relationships in your life. Since God wants to learn us how to, uh, 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 us to, learn how to love, it's one of the key things that God put you on this earth for is, is to build deep friendships. And so when somebody says, I don't have time for friends, I'm too busy at my work, or I'm too busy with this or that, I don't have time for friends, I want to remind you that there's four reasons. And I just want to share this with you. If somebody comes to you and says, I'm too busy for relationships, I think there are four things that you can say to them that I think are straight from the Bible and are really important. I put these in your notes, and I'd love for you to write these down so that you can share them with people, because this is one of those things, if you miss this in life, you miss everything. Here here it is, number one, four reasons why you need awesome relationships. Number one is for spiritual growth. It's worth your time to build friendships for your spiritual growth. You cannot be all that God wants you to be if you don't, you can't do that all by yourself. <laughs> Period, done, I don't need to say anymore. Well, since he didn't say amen, let me add a little bit. <laughs> You got to have friends in, in your life to accomplish God's purpose for your life. Romans chapter 1 verse 12 says this. Paul writes, I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me. Say this last line, would you? And my faith will help you. My faith will help you. The second reason you need awesome, meaningful re relationships in your life is for emotional support. Life is a long journey. And you got to have companions on the journey of life. I think there are two kinds of people in life. There's VDPs and VIPs. VDPs are very dependent people. VIPs are, are, are very inspirational people. VDPs will drain you. And, and I know it, a lot of this today, you're going to look at me and go, well, that's kind of just common sense. Well, yeah, but I happen to believe what the Bible says is common sense. Anybody with me on that? And so you, you need fewer VDPs, very uh, dependent people, and you need more VDPs. VIPs, very inspirational people, people who will inspire you to bring out the best that you can be. And the Bible has this phrase, one another. There's 58 commands in the Bible that use that phrase and then something else. Uh, love one another, care for one another, help one another, serve one another, greet one another, uh, encourage one another. 58 commands in the Bible. And if you don't have meaningful relationships, you can't obey that command. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, carry each other's burdens and in this, in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Number three, you need, how many people go, man, he's whipping through these points fast. This is good. Amen. Number three, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Little bit too much encouragement there. There we go. You need awesome friends. Number three, for better health. I see my doctor right back here. I love it when I, my doctor's in church. I, I know if anything happens, she's going to be there for me and help me out. If it's not just the Bible, and I hope you understand everything that I say today is from the Bible, but hey, listen, God's word says this, the Bible says this, and then science has confirmed it over and over that you will actually live longer, you'll live, you'll live healthier if you have these healthy, meaningful relationships. And Dr. Hindelang, would you just say amen just real quick? Did she say it, Dave? Okay, good. I didn't hear. She's very quiet. 
<laughs> people without friends don't live. Science says this. People without friends, meaningful relationships, don't live as long as people that have these great relationships, and they're not, they're not as healthy. And one of the reasons is friends... Listen, if you have these deep, meaningful relationships, then you have a place to unload your negative emotions. We need that. That's why James says, James chapter 5, verse 16, admit your faults to one another, pray for each other, so that you may be, and what's the last word right there? Listen to me, and you've heard me say this before. If you want to be forgiven, go to God and ask God to forgive you. He will forgive you of your sins. Bottom line, that's it. Just confess it to God if that's all you want with your past regrets. But if you want to be healed in your life, you not only go to God and ask him, confess before God, but if you want to get over them, the starting point is to share them with somebody else in your life. Not with everybody, with, but with those meaningful relationships in your life. Hey, listen, this is what I went through, and, and I... I, I just need to tell you, I need to share this with somebody. Reveal, and you've heard me say this, revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. You know those habits, those things that you have regrets about in your past. You don't like them. What are you going to do with them? Well, you're not going to get well on your own. You need other people. God just wired us this way as human beings that there's just some things in life like regrets, habits, that we don't get over them by ourselves. We need other people that are closest to us, meaningful relationships that we can gang tackle those habits and those regrets in life. Number four, you need great meaningful friends. Number four, for social enjoyment. Social enjoyment. Life is meant to be enjoyed, not merely endured. And friendships are like the bedrock that's the cornerstone of a satisfying life. You can, you can make a lot of money in life. You can have a lot of achievements in life. But then if your relationship stinks, let, let me just be honest with you. Your life will stink. Nothing can compensate for a lack of good, meaningful relationships. When you have awesome friends, then your joys are doubled and your sorrows are cut in half. We say that all the time with small groups. You double your joy, you divide your sorrows in half. Okay, now, since these are the reasons that I need awesome, meaningful friendships and relationships in my life, spiritual growth, emotional support, uh, better health, and social enjoyment. Okay, I get that, Craig, that's great. But I know what you're asking right now. You're going, okay, where can I go to get friends like that, to meet friends like that? Well, I, I, I just want to tell you there's a Dallas Cowboys support group that's meeting this afternoon. <laughs> there's a gentleman that came in today, and maybe he's right here in the service, and maybe he could just raise his hand if he's in here. But uh, he came in, and, and he had this shirt on that had Dallas Cowboys stuff all over it. Is, is he here? Is, could you just... Is, no? I don't see him. It's just stand up if it's you. <laughs> he decided not to come in. Hey, what do you know? He, he just wanted to show up and then leave and go watch the game. I'm pretty sure that's the way it was. But where do you go? Come on, think about this. How do, how do I make friends like that? Those meaningful. Craig, I get it that that's what we need in life. It's important. It, it, it's one of the most important ingredients to happiness in my life. Okay, I'm with you on that. But how do I meet those friends? Well, obviously, from pastor, you're going to hear me stand up and say, hey, listen, it's a church, Right? Because at church, you're going to find people with the best character. You're going to find people with similar goals and similar values. But specifically, I want to kind of lock in on two specific things, not just church in general. But if you want to have authentic, deep, meaningful relationships, I would encourage you to do two things. You're going to write these down, right? Number one, I think the first thing, if you want these deep, meaningful relationships, and there's nowhere to write this in your notes, you just have to put it off the side, is I, I think you need to get involved in the ministry, and when we say ministry, it's just taking what you do well, the gifts that God has given you, what you have a passion for, and helping other people. That's ministry to us. That's, that's serving. When you serve, what's going to happen is you're going to be uh, shoulder to shoulder with people you're serving with, and those people are great people. And we have so many different ministries. I know we have a ministry that you'll find that will fit you just perfectly. Hundreds of people. Do you realize this? That hundreds of people every Sunday are involved in ministry in this church family. And I'm sure you're sitting here today going, well, I come to church and I sit here and I feel so ministered to. And there's so many people that are making sure this experience is just absolutely perfect. But, but maybe you're saying on top of that, I need to now give back. I need to serve other people. Well, great. You'll, in serving and getting a place of ministry... 
and getting involved, you'll be shoulder to shoulder with somebody else and you'll find new friends, quality people that you can develop deep, deep friendships with. The fastest way to have these great, meaningful relationships is through serving with other wonderful people in this church. And I, I, I can't get any more specific than that than to piggyback on that and to say the other specific way, not only doing ministry with other people, but also being in small group with other people. All we've seen as a church, not just with small groups, we are a ch- small church with our of small, it's a major part of, of our life. We're a church of small groups. You're not going to really feel a part of this church until you get involved in a small group where people are caring about you, you're caring about them. We have about three quarters of the people that call OVCN their church home, about three quarters of the people. We, you will hear this over and over how important small groups are in our church. And, and, and I love that. About three quarters of the people that are, are part of our church are involved in small groups. Have us, are, could say, hey, here's my small group. Last Sunday, we had 60 people join our church. It was, if you missed last Sunday, you missed a huge Sunday. We had people from way, in, in this service, LaDonna kind of messed us up because she was in the way over here. But we scrunched <laughs> up a bunch of people over here. We love LaDonna. We scut- and, and it went, listen, all the way from that side over to this side and then kind of cornered a little bit. It was awesome, 60 people. I thought about it this week. I thought there were twice as many people that joined last Sunday than were in the first church that I, Robin and I went to. That's incredible. There's a lot of people last Sunday, 60 people. And you know what about those 60 people? Almost, maybe not all of them, but a good portion of them are already involved in, in a small group. You say, why? Because that's where you, you do the one another's. Well, how do I develop these awesome relationships? If I had to summarize it, I would say it's real simple. It's follow the golden rule. If you're not sure with the golden rule, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus did the greatest sermon ever, and in the sermon, he gave us the golden rule of life, of how to build friendships. And most people know it. I, I want to read it out loud to you, and I want you to just kind of soak it in. It's Matthew chapter 7. Verse 12, and Jesus says this. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. You say, well, what's the law and the prophets? The law and the prophets, Jesus was saying, is the Bible. This is what the Bible says. It, it, what Jesus is saying here is you do to other people what you would like them to do for you. And I've heard people say, they mess up the golden rule a lot, and they say, well, you're supposed to do to other people what they do to you. That's not the golden rule. <laughs> Listen, the golden rule is basically you treat other people the way you want them to treat you. Everybody with me on this? The golden rule. And and so let's apply that to friendship right now. If you really want to have great, deep, meaningful, lifelong relationships and friendships, it's real simple. Be the friend that you want somebody to be to you. I had somebody after the last service. It was fabulous. It couldn't be any better than this. I'm walking outside. I'm shaking people's hands, and these two ladies come out, and one lady looked at me, and she goes, did you know that we've known each other, talking to this other lady, we've known each other for 46 years, and we were sitting by each other today, and she wrote in my bulletin something, this wonderful, I can't think what the phrase said, but this wonderful phrase of thank you for being my friend for 46 years. I want you to have those kind of relationships in your life. And it's real simple. You got to be the friend that you want somebody else to be to you. You got you to have those deep friendships. And you're not going to have those unless you're that friend to somebody else. Because you will attract what you are, uh, 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 not what you want. Watch this. You don't attract what you want in life. You attract what you are. If you are a shallow person, then guess what you're going to attract as a friend? You're going to attract shallow people. If you are loving in those relationships in your life, you're going to attract people who are loving back to you. If you were a gossip, you were going to attract a bunch of gossipers. If you're a bitter person, you're going to attract people who are bitter and complain about everything. You attract what you are. And if you really want deep, loyal friends in your life, then you've got to be that kind of person to other people first. And so today I want to look at six golden rules of building relationships. And I know what you're saying. You're sitting here going, well, these just seem so logical and seem so 
But that's the way the Bible is. It's so logical. And, and I, I just got to tell you, these, these principles, these golden uh, rules of relationships work at work. They work in marriages. They work uh, uh, wherever you have, in small groups, wherever you want to build relationships, these things work. And I got to say this before I get started. This last week, I went through three days. It, it, it was really sad. I went through three days of not having my phone. Anybody ever done that before? <sighs> Just you do anything else, but don't take my phone away from me for three days. And when I got it back, I, I'll never forget. I got it back and it was like, oh, I missed you so much. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody here, you know what I'm talking about? I didn't think I'd, I'd miss it that much. And, 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 and I was having, I, I, I was with my mom and I said, mom, do you mind texting Robin or whoever and telling me? And I just had my mom text everybody, but it wasn't until I got my phone back. And all of a sudden I thought, you know what? This is kind of, I live kind of a messed up life. <laughs> and I thought, hold on one second. In our, not just me, but in our society, I think we have gone so attached to the phone, to the cell phone, that we've forgotten how to, do, how to build great relationships. And there's nobody teaching this. There's nobody saying to our society, here's how you build great relationships. And here's where the, these foundations, here's what the foundation of these principles are from. So I'm telling you today, here are six laws of how to build great friendships. And it's built on all six of these, these rules, golden rules of friendship are built on the Bible. That's a pretty good foundation. So I want you to write these six things down and I want you to work on these things. And I want you to be passing these things off to other people because these are really important. These are like the six golden rules, uh, laws of, of how to build deep, meaningful friendships in your life. Number one, you got to invest time. That's the starting point. You invest time and energy to build relationships and friendships. Deep friendships are not accidental. Deep friendships are intentional. They're a choice. Deep friendships are not instant. It takes time to build these meaningful relationships. I, I think about the people in my small group. I, I would trust the people in my small group. I would trust those people with my life, hands down. No, no questions asked. You say, well, why? Well, because we've been through life together for the last five to 10 years, some of them more than that. And we've gone through ser serious illnesses together. We've gone through the passing of, of family members together. Uh, Naomi, and I was just kind of looking for her up front. I don't see her. I saw her mom earlier. But Naomi, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, she lost her husband. Her husband died of cancer. And Dave, and, and our small group wrapped our arms around her. And we walked with her through those, those dark days. We've had people in our small group go through surgeries. And we're always there for them. We've gone through celebrations celebrations and we celebrate together, deep friendships are not cheap. You have to choose to invest time and energy and effort. Proverbs 18, 24, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. <laughs> Here's the point that I want to make. Stop waiting for people to be your friend. You show them how to be a friend. You be the friend first that you want them to be to you. You make the effort first. You show them, hey, this is who I, I want to attract, and they will come back at you strong. And by the way, if somebody shows up in your life, and the only time they show up is when they have a need in their life, they are not a friend. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, do not be, in, do not be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. If you will follow that verse, then you'll have more friends than you can ever imagine. Don't just, don't just be interested in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. And let me say it this way. If you will pick up this principle, and if you will practice that verse that was just up there, Philippians, and you'll be interested in other people and get interested in their lives and what's going on, you'll have more friends in two months than you can have in two years trying to get people to be interested in you. Let me just share with you, other people are not interested in you. <laughs> I hate to tell you that, but they're interested in themselves. And you'll get far more friends becoming interested in you becoming interested in them. You'll get far more friends that way than trying to get people to be interested in you. My point is, I got to invest the time in the relationships. You can't be a friend without showing up. You can't be a friend without your presence. In fact, would you just write just somewhere off to the side and invest, uh, invest the time, the first golden rule, would you just put show up? 
You just got to show us. Physical presence is, is essential in having long-term, meaningful friendships. Friends show up. They're present. When somebody says to you, you know, we're going to have a small group this week, and you look at them and go, well, you know, I'm kind of busy, and I don't feel like it, and I'll, I'll be there in spirit. Do you know what it means to be there in spirit? <laughs> Nothing. That's a bunch of baloney. You cannot be there in spirit anywhere. You can't be there. If you're, if you're not there in body, you ain't there. So you've got to show up. And, and even when you don't feel like, you know, I don't feel like going to small. Doesn't matter. Show up. You've got to show up and you've got to make that investment. Number two, the second golden rule of friendship is you've got to earn their trust. If you want to build friendships, meaningful friendships, you've got to earn those people's trust. Trust is what, it's like the bedrock that makes friendships, friendships. Without trust, not a friendship. The difference between an acquaintance and a friend, acquaintance is somebody you talk to, a friend is somebody you trust. And here's what the Bible says, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, many people claim to be a friend, but it's rare to find someone who is truly trustworthy. That's the word. How many of you would agree with that verse? Anybody just say, yep, Craig, you're right. The Bible says you earn people's trust three ways, whether it's marriage or coworker or, or uh, any relationship. You earn trust in people three ways. And I didn't have room to put this in, so just off to the side, put three words. The first word is the word reliable. You got to be reliable. You got to be able to be counted on. And the Bible says this in Proverbs, a friend loves you, not most of the time, a friend loves you all of the time. It means when you're sick, it means when you're irritated, it means when you're lonely, it means when they're being a jerk, that friend still shows up. A friend loves you all the time. The greatest ability in life, talking about friendship, the greatest ability you can have in building a relationship is your reliability. Friend who is trustworthy. The second way you build uh, trust is not just uh, reliable, but you got to be loyal. Would you write the word loyal? Loyalty is a commitment that says, I'm going to put you and what you need before what I need. Loyalty is, is actually the opposite of being self-centered. Loyalty is, is I'm going to help you right now instead of helping myself. And back to Proverbs uh, chapter 17, verse 17 says, a true friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. They show up. <laughs> I, I, I love to say this. You know who your friends are. They show up when it's time to move. <laughs> right? Either that or they just love pizza. One of those two. They show up when you're tired. They show up when, when, I need, when I need your help. They show up. They're there. Proverbs 19, verse 22 says, loyalty. I love this verse. Lo you go look it up. It says, loyalty makes a person attractive. How many of you would like to be more attractive? My hand's up first. <laughs> the Bible says that being loyal, if you're loyal to somebody in a friendship, people will look past you, warts and all, all those things that are horrible. They'll look past that and they'll go, wow. You know, that person, that, they, they're a beautiful person because that's what loyalty does. Loyalty makes you more attractive. I'm in on that, right? And then the third thing that will build trust, remember we're talking about trust, earn their trust. Third thing you do is by keeping confidences. There's three ways you build trust, reliable, loyal, keep confidences. Everybody needs one person in their life, at least one, that I can share anything with that person, anything in my life, and they're not going to reject me. They're always going to be there for me. Someone that you can share everything. You can share your worst fears, the worst things that you feel about yourself, your doubts, and it's essential that that person remains Confidential. They don't go, that, that's why in small groups we have a phrase, what happens and what's said in small groups stays in small groups. Amen? Amen. That's, that your secret, listen, when you, when you share something personal about your life, it's, it's safe with us. Proverbs 11 verse 13 says, no one who gossips can be trusted, but you can put your confidence in someone who is trustworthy. If you want to have deep friendships, you got to zip it. Some of you laugh, but you know what I'm talking about, and you're going, man, I, I struggle. Just, just today, just say, hey, listen, I'm not going to gossip anymore. And by the way, anybody that gossips to you, eventually, they're going to gossip about you. Mm. Number three, third golden rule of friendship. Number one, invest the time. Number two, earn their trust. Number three, write this in. Listen with empathy. Listening is probably the most important skill in building relationships, because you can't love people without listening. And there's a difference between hearing and listening. <laughs> Come on, guys, we know this, right? <laughs> you can hear someone and not really listen to them. 
I, I didn't hear the guys go amen on that one. Because <laughs> you weren't listening. That's really funny. <laughs> And not, when I talk, you say, well, Craig, what do you mean by listen? I'm, I'm ta- when I say listen, I'm talking about listening with empathy. Empathy is just a fancy word for you're putting yourself into their shoes. When they're talking about how they feel, you're putting yourself in their situation. Ask yourself, how would I feel if I was going through that? So listening with empathy means you're putting yourself in their position. And you listen to their fears. You listen to their feelings. You listen to what's not being said really important in listening. You're not trying to fix that person and what they're going through. You're just listening. Sometimes I hear people say, well, pastor, I just wouldn't know what to say. Well, the truth is listening. Sometimes healing comes by just listening to them. You don't need to fix it. Guys, we struggle with this. And the reason we struggle with this is because we're just natural fixers. It's who we are. It's part of, we're built this way. How how many of you husbands have had your wife look at you and say, why is it you're always trying to fix things? I I just need you to listen. Five of us, the rest of you are lying. (laughs) So I want to help you with this. So I want to play this video, and I think this says it so well. It cracks me up every time I see it. I want to show you about a 90-second video, and in this video... I. I think it helps wives understand what guys go through when we really want to listen. But it's so hard for us not to fix the situation. And so I'm not saying this is accurate. I'm just saying this is probably the way guys feel. Watch this. It's just there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And... I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless, and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. You do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop right? trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. (laughs) It is. Thank you. Ow! Come on, if you would just- Don't! (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so when you- if you're married and you get in the car today and you're going home, all the guys, you have my permission to look at your spouse and go, I have no idea what that video was about. I, I just don't get it whatsoever. The fourth rule, I've got to keep on moving. The fourth rule, golden rule of friendship is you've got to accept their flaws. We all have flaws. We all have faults. Nobody's perfect. And everybody said? <laughs> the Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 15, verse 7, that accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. And then God will be glorified. Jesus accepted you. You know how he accepted you? He accepted you completely. It doesn't mean that Jesus approves of everything you do or I do. It means he accepts you. I I love that verse. Because the only way he can minister, the only way he can reach out to me is if he accepts me. And and, and that means that you've got to, now Jesus looks it up and says, okay, now you need to do the same thing. You've got to accept other people the way that they are, not the way you want them to be. And here's here's another proverb, Proverbs 17, verse 9, overlooking a person's fault, cultivates love. I love this last part. Say this with me, would you, this last part? But nagging about them destroys friendships. Isn't that great? All right, here we go. Number fifth, number five, the fifth golden rule of friendship is celebrate wins and share losses. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Small group is supposed to do both of those. Friendship. Is supposed to do both of those. Let's look at each of them. First one is, is wins. You need to learn to celebrate. Not just the things that happen to you, 
But you need to learn to celebrate the good things that happen to the other people that you have those meaningful relationships with without being critical and without being jealous. This is so huge. Hear me on this. Don't, don't let me lose you on this point. If I only know how to celebrate the good that happens to me and my wins in my life, I'm only going to have a, a, a few amount of wins I'm going to be happy, unhappy most of my life. But if I look at other people around me and there's several people that I want to build those close, uh, meaningful relationships with, then you're able to celebrate the happiness of a lot of different people and you'll be happy your entire life because there's always going to be something that you can celebrate in the people around you. Maybe you didn't get a promotion, but they did. Celebrate that. Don't be jealous. If you can learn to celebrate other people's wins instead of being jealous about it, then you will be happy most of your life. If you don't pick up on this principle, then you're going to be miserable most of your life. You need to celebrate their wins and celebrate their joys. But then on the flip side of that are the losses. I can't think about losses without thinking of my small group. We've had so many losses. We've, we've gone through the uh, loss of job in different people's lives. We've gone through funerals of parents. We've gone through a lot of pain. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, Paul writes this. If one part of the body suffers, then all the parts of the sh- uh, share in its suffering. If one part is praised, then all the uh, uh, others' parts share in the happiness. Which brings me to the last golden rule of friendship, and that is bring out their best. Here's the point. You want to help people become the people that they can't be without you. No, nobody can become all that they're meant to be by themselves. They need other people around them. It's a big lesson in life. There are people in your life that need you. You're the best friend, and, 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 and you're the person that brings out the best in each other. You, your lives are richer because you're, you're, you're friends. Your life is fuller. There's, there's more meaning in life because you're best friends with them, and they'll help you grow. You help them grow, and you help them improve. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, verse 17, just as iron, iron sharpens iron, friends sharpen the minds of each other. So everything that we've talked about today, it can be all kind of wrapped up into this one phrase that Jesus said when he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You treat them as you want to be treated. You are to be a friend to other people the way you want them to be a friend to you. And if you follow these six golden rules of friendships from the Bible, then you will be able to build deep, meaningful, long-lasting friendships, and you're not going to be getting to the end of your life and just be absolutely lonely. That sounds so depressing, doesn't it? I want that to be encouraging. That in the early stages, middle stages of your life, you build into those relationships so that at the end of life, you're not going to be lonely. Everybody with me on that point? So I love reading. uh, I love when when, uh, organizations do studies and and they study churches and they come up with statistics that help us understand why churches and people do what they do. And there's this organization called Lifeway and they did a study among, they surveyed Christian members in churches in America, Christian churches, and they discovered that in the average church, only about 50% of the people in those churches they studied said that they have, they've developed significant relationships with people in the church family. Only about half of the people in the churches that they did the study with said that they had deep, meaningful, these relationships that we're talking about today, only about half of the people said, yeah, I got that. Now watch this. Same study, same question. When they asked the question to people who were in small groups in those churches, all of a sudden the percentage jumped to 90%. Had deep, meaningful relationships in that church. So I want to say this today, and I want to say it, I want to be pushy without you thinking I'm pushy, so I'll say it real nicely. (laughs) I need you to be in a small group. 
So the second, three statistics, second statistic they found said in church, average churches, only 42% of people said, I know my spiritual gift is, I use it to serve God and I use it to serve other people, only 42%. But those people that are in small groups, it's that number jumped to 75% of people knew their spiritual gift were serving God by serving other people. Here's the third statistic. In a church, only these Christian churches in America, average church, only 45% uh, say, I find myself thinking about Bible church truths tr- throughout the day. Only four, that's less than half, 45%. But if you're in a small group, they found, same study, when people get in small group, that number turns to 75%. So I just want to say this nicely and kindly and yet be a little bit pushy. I need you to get in a small group. If you look at me today and go, hey, Craig, I'm already in a small group like 75% of our people are. That's great, wonderful. It's time to get our small groups cranked back up. If you need new curriculum, I want to tell you, David and Gail Bowman, who used to lead our small groups, they got assigned up years ago to this curriculum uh, called Right, uh, right Now. Right now, did I get it right? Uh, we were they, we were the first church ever to sign up for this uh, online curriculum, and now all the curriculum, all the best curriculum in churches and Christian churches are on right now media, and you have access to it through our church. We'll help if you let us know. Hey, we need curriculum. We'll, uh, we'll help you. We'll help you with the best studies that they're out there. And and, and I want to tell you, it's it's a great thing. Now there's thousands of churches, but we were the first. That's pretty cool. If you look at me today and say, well, you know, Craig, I was in a small group and, you know, I, uh, I it just wasn't a good fit, so I'm, I'm not going to do small groups. <laughs> Number one, I'd want to laugh at you, which would not nice. <laughs> because you know what? If you went to a restaurant and you didn't find a good fit, would you stop eating? Or if you went to somebody to cut your hair and you didn't like the way that that's not a good fit, would that mean you wouldn't cut your hair anymore? No. If you go to a small group, it's not a good fit. We'll find a new small group. Just look at those people. Say, I love you. I'll see you at church every once in a while. But the truth is, I need to find another small group. We'll help you find a small group. If you're sitting here and you're going, well, Craig, I don't know how to get involved in a small group. Wonderful. I'm glad you asked. Next Sunday night, we have a connection event. It's about an hour and a half. If you'll come next Sunday night, all the information, in fact, at the bottom of your notes, all that information is right there. We'll help you get involved in a small group that will love you and care for you. You'll find these meaningful relationships. You'll serve with those people and it'll be a wonderful thing. You'll love being involved in small group in our church. They meet a couple times a month. You get together when you're going through a tough time. They'll be there for you to walk you through those dark days. When you're going and celebrating, they will celebrate with you. And I just want to say this as nicely and as kindly as I can. You need to get involved in a small group. Amen? Great. You said amen. I can, I can close now. <laughs> Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, I think about my small group. And Robin and I, we love those people in our small group. They mean so much to us. They've walked us through some pretty dark days a year ago. Heavenly Father, it was my small group that loved me and cared for me and walked me through those days. Heavenly Father, it was that small group that uh, that looked at me and said, hey, Craig, you need to rethink that. And so I just want to start off and I want to say, God, thank you for the small group that you've given me, people that care about me, love me. And Heavenly Father, I pray that for every person here. I pray, Lord, we all want this deep inside. We all need those deep, meaningful relationships in our life. And so I pray, Lord, that you'll push us and, 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 and you'll prod us just a little bit. And, and we'll come to that point where however we get involved in a small group, that we won't go through another season without saying, okay, God, I get it. I'm going to be a part of a small group and I'm going to care for them and they're going to care for me and we're going to do life together. Thank you for this great church, wonderful people. Just pray you'll bless each one of us as we do life together. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray these things and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you.